Let's read together in the Word of God in the sequence of our Sunday morning studies in the Old Testament in the first book of Chronicles, chapter 20. Quite a bit through it, page 400 and something in my Bible, but after 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, then you'll find 1st Chronicles, and we've reached chapter 20 in this story. And this is a short chapter. It's in some ways a, a slightly puzzling chapter. There are a lot of things not said in this chapter that we need to know about, but we'll try to make th that evident later in the service. First Chronicles chapter 20 at verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, Joab, the commander-in-chief, led out the army and ravaged the country of the Ammonites and came and besieged Rabbah. But David the king did not lead his people. David the king remained at Jerusalem. And Joab smote Rabbah and overthrew it, and David took the crown of their king from his head. He found that it weighed a talent of gold, and, it was, and in it was a precious stone, and it was placed on David's head. And he brought forth the spoil of the city, a very great amount. And he brought forth the people who were in it and set them to labor with saws and iron picks and axes. And thus David did to all the cities of the Ammonites. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. And after this, some considerable time after this, there arose war with the Philistines at Gezer. Then Sibekei, the Hushathite, slew Sippai, who was one of the descendants of the giants, and the Philistines were subdued. And there was again war with the Philistines, and Elhanan, the son of Jair, Shulachmi, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam, and there was a man of great stature among the Philistines who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in number. And he also was descended from the giants. And when he taunted Israel, as Goliath had earlier taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemiah, David's brother, slew him. These were descended from the giants in Gath. And they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. It's not without significance that the very first word of the next chapter is Satan. Amen and may God bless to us the reading of his word and help us to learn well from it. Now will you turn with me in your Bibles to the first book of Chronicles and the 20th chapter so that we might learn from this chapter lessons, spiritual lessons that are absolutely fundamental to Christian life and service. And if we are going to understand and benefit from this chapter, there is something that we must point out straight away with regard to the very first verse of the chapter hinted at this last Sunday morning. If you look at the first ch verse of chapter 20 of First Chronicles and read right through the verse until you come to the statement that David remained at Jerusalem. Then put in there, as I have put in in my Bible, a little ink mark, a little oblique mark. Because between that point, David remained at Jerusalem, and the next part of the verse, Joab smote Rabbah and overthrew it, we have to set the story of the second book of Samuel, chapters 11 and 12. And if you say, well, what are these two chapters in Samuel all about? 
They are the story of David's great sin with Bathsheba and the murder, the deliberate, calculated murder of Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, and all this subsequent, this murder subsequent to the fact that David, the king and the leader of God's people, stole another man's wife and committed adultery with her. And then when we go a little further down the chapter, we come to the end of verse 3. And between verse 3 and verse 4, again I have made a mark in the margin of my Bible to remind me that between verses 3 and 4 of this chapter, we have to place all the story that we find in the second book of Samuel from chapter 13 down to chapter 21, which chapters tell the tragic story of David's family sins, what the members of the family did to each other, some terrible things, the story of David's family tragedies, the story of the rebellion of Absalom, David's son, who stole the heart of the people from their father, and all that resulted from that in the terribleness of civil war. So you see, in a sense, we have before us this morning a chapter that misses out a lot of history. But we have reminded ourselves about it. And the story of great sin, of David's great sin, and the story of David's family tragedies over many years are not included by the chronicler when he's writing this book. But there is no doubt at all that the, chronicle, the chronicler knew all these stories. And so did the people for whom the book of Chronicles was written. And these people were the Jews who had returned from their 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And they were facing a demanding future as they rebuilt Jerusalem and re-established the kingdom of Judah and carried forward the work of God. And the message to them really is, if even David could go astray, if even David, a man of his spiritual caliber, needed to watch and to pray and keep close to God, so must we. And, of course, the message above all else to the people for whom Chronicles was written was this. If even David, who sinned so greatly and so disastrously, could be forgiven and restored, then there is hope for us who likewise are great sinners. And so we come to this chapter this morning with the question, at least I do, the question in my heart which I bring to you. What have we to learn from this chapter for ourselves and for the work of God for the remainder of 1988, for 1989, and for the years that lie ahead of us in the grace of God. Well, let's begin this way by reminding ourselves, as most of us know, that in the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord Jesus Christ counseled us to live one day at a time. That marvelous statement, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Live one day at a time. And that, of course, is truth, and it is also wise counsel, and it is essentially calling for an attitude of faith. Trust me, day by day. Give us day by day our daily bread. But on the other hand, we have to recognize that life is not just a collection 
of separate days. Today is not only, it's different from yesterday, but it is not separate from yesterday. And tomorrow when it comes will not be independent of today and yesterday and the days that have gone before. Life is not a collection of separate days. One day leads to another. And today, for better or for worse, prepares for tomorrow. And so it always is. There is a sequence in life. Think of it like this. If in the course of daily life, including Christian service, if we overdo things with no real rest or relaxation, we will inevitably experience a build-up of tiredness which will affect us physically, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. And in that situation or condition of vulnerability, as we said to the children, there is a devil waiting. Or again, if we allow by neglect, if we allow our spiritual lives to become shallow, and dried up and talking about our fellowship with God, if we allow our walk with God to become routine rather than real, with no real fellowship with God, no, no real bringing, bringing of the whole of our life within, within the presence of God, then inevitably we will become increasingly self-absorbed Absorbed with all the, with all the bits and pieces that, that cause life to be rather complicated and things that are distracting and bothering and this and that and the other. And becoming self-absorbed, we will tend to forget about God. And we will not be aware of the fact, we will not realize that God is not with us as he formerly was with us, and that we are not with God as once we walked with God, and we will not be aware of this until some significant crisis comes, and the devil will be waiting. Or again, if, I'm using lots of ifs today. I'm wanting to make you think, as I have been made to think. If, no matter how sincere we are, and we emphasized last Sunday morning into the study of chapter 19 that David was very sincere in what he did in chapter 19. But no matter how sincere we are, if we rush into situations and plans and commitments without being assured of God's will, or if we hold back from steps forward, which God is in indicating clearly, if we, so on the one hand, either if we, if we rush ahead or if we hold back, no matter how sincere we are, I believe we are in danger because there is a devil waiting. Now, this was the situation, as I've just indicated, that David created <coughs> in chapter 19 when, in a very well-meaning way, in complete sincerity, although he could have done to have thought a bit about a bit more about it, but very well meaning and very sincerely, he made a sentimental approach of friendship to the king of the Ammonites. Because the young, there was a new young king of the Ammonites, and this young king's father, on some occasion, many, many years previously, had done a very, very kind deed for David and helped him at a particular stage. 
And David thought about that, and oh well, the 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 old the old man was a was a bit of a rascal. He wasn't a very nice chap at all. But here's here's his young son, newly made king, and well, because the father was kind to me all these years ago, I'll extend friendship to the king of the Ammonites. Well meaning, sincere, but I believe it was essentially a sentimental approach. And of course the Ammonite rebuffed David insulted David's messengers and this led as we discovered last week to a confrontation and a very bitter war and in that war victories were won but the situation of conflict and and battle continued it's always easy, it's always easy to start a war it's very difficult to stop it and even when sometimes it is officially stopped, it goes on unofficially in a whole lot of different areas. And that was the situation at the end of First Chronicles chapter 19. And we have to re- recognize that David, David because of personal considerations, you know, his sentimental thoughts with regard to the young king of the Ammonites. David, as a result of personal considerations, involved the work, the whole of the work of God and the people of God in ongoing conflict. He landed his people with a whole lot of continuing battles. And that's how we come to the beginning of chapter 20. And in the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, it was accepted that if there was a battle, then the king would lead his people. And rightly so, because he was the king. And particularly in this case, because it was David himself who had set the whole conflict situation in motion. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle... Joab, no doubt instructed by King David, led out the army and ravaged the country of the Ammonites and came and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Do you see what it means? Instead of being in his place, his rightful place, at the head of his people... Instead of being there to lead his people in person, giving them both the example and the inspiration for service, David contracted out. David remained at Jerusalem. He knew the battles were going on. He knew the battles had to be fought. He knew the demand of the situation. (coughs) In a sense, he knew the people's need of him. But David remained at Jerusalem. Now, he did not abdicate. He was still the king. He did not think his work was done. He was still the leader, the shepherd, the guide, and the friend of his people. But at this particular stage, we are not doubting his sincerity. We think he was mistaken. But at this particular stage, he gave over the reins, he gave over the leadership of his people to a trusted man. What is that? A trusted man whose name was Joab. Now I took the trouble to look up the Bible dictionaries and I was reminded, I had thought about it, I was reminded that this man Joab was a strange mixture of a man. He was sometimes very wise and very good. He was sometimes very bad and very cruel. But he was a trusted man. And in many ways David had good grounds for trusting him. And David gave over the leadership of the people at this particular stage to Joab. 
and David remained at Jerusalem. Now, there is no suggestion in the story that David was deliberately careless. After all his many battles and struggles and persecutions, he had established the kingdom of Israel. He, as king and the people with him, were right with God in a way that previously they had not been right with God. The spiritual life of the kingdom had been established because the ark of God was there at Jerusalem and David himself was the man who had said, God first. But David remained at Jerusalem. He contracted out of the work. There is no suggestion that he was deliberately careless. There, was no suge there is no suggestion in the story that David was complacent. No suggestion at all. Not even in the story in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. Now, he may, be, he may have been complacent. I don't know. It's very easy to be spiritually complacent. When you've stood your ground as a Christian for a good number of years, you think, oh, well, I'm pretty stable now. Remember what we said to the children, there's a devil. When we have fought many battles, whether individually or congregationally, and our work has been established, it's the easiest thing in the world to be complacent. But there is a devil. No suggestion that David was deliberately careless. No clear suggestion that he was complacent. No suggestion in the story that David was unduly hurt or offended by the king of the Ammonites who, who so crudely and cruelly rejected his friendship. He may have been, but that is not emphasized in the story. But what is emphasized in the story is simply this, that when David should have been in his place, leading his people, he wasn't there. David remained at Jerusalem. Now I want to go on to point out that because of this, David was in spiritual danger. I don't think the work was in spiritual danger because after all the battles were won. But David was in spiritual danger without realizing it. You see why we sang that hymn Watch and Pray. David, I'm assuming that in measure you know the Bible story, David had been chosen by God and described by God as a man after God's own heart. That's 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. And the whole of Scripture testifies to the spiritual caliber and the spiritual significance of David. And it was simply because he was God's man that he was the target for the devil. I took the trouble when I was preparing to go back in my Bible to that story that I mentioned in 2 Samuel beginning in chapter 11. And I read there, same as we have in Chronicles, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab and his, and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. And then these words, it happened. To get the feeling that I would, I'm not wanting to add to Scripture, 
But in order that we might understand, we could read, David remained at Jerusalem. It just happened. Late one afternoon, when David arose from his couch and was walking upon the roof of the king's house, that he saw. It just happened. Oh, what a coincidence. There's a devil. And didn't we sing about the devil who waits for thine unguarded hours? And it was such with David when he tarried at Jerusalem. The whole thing just happened, almost incidentally. No deliberate, calculated plan on David's part to do wrong. He wasn't that kind of man. But in one moment, this is what frightens me about this story. In one moment, and I hope this is the right way to describe it, in one moment, the snare of the devil snapped shut. In that one moment, David was trapped. And in a sense, what happened subsequently was almost inevitable. And that one moment started a long story of sin and shame and murder and disaster. And all because the man of God, through various influences and because of various reactions, was not where God wanted him to be at that time, in his place at the head of his people. Now you may rightly say that's all very well, preacher, and we, we take the solemn message. I hope you do. But you may say in chapter 20 of First Chronicles, David's sin is not mentioned. Granted. But it is recorded in Scripture. And the agony and the misery of David's heart and David's life during the year or more after his great sin, when he covered up his sin, when he excused his sin, when he justified himself and refused to repent and return to God, the awfulness of that spell. You can read for yourself in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Psalm 32 is the psalm that begins with that immense sigh of relief, Oh, the blessedness of the man whose sin is forgiven. But after that opening verse of the psalm, David goes on to describe how in the aftermath of that sin, his whole life and personality dried up and shriveled and wasted away, and he went through agonies that were almost indescribable. I'm not exaggerating. Read Psalm 32. And then go to Psalm number 51 where you, where you read that prayer from David's heart. Where, oh, you know the psalm where he says, Oh God, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in my sight, in thy sight. In that psalm, David prays and says, O oh God, create in me a clean heart. Restore in me a right spirit. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. And then I'll be able to serve you the way that I once served you. And you see, all this stemmed from the fact that David remained at Jerusalem. 
when he should have been in a certain place, he wasn't there. Of course, one reason, perhaps the main reason here in Chronicles, why David's sin is not mentioned is simply this. David's God is the God who forgives. If I remember rightly, the organist was playing partly during the offering the tune of the hymn that says, Today thy mercy calls us to wash away our sin. However great our trespass, whatever we have been, ah, you see, we mustn't forget David's God. Because David's God is the God who forgives, the God who cleanses, the God who restores. And as the Bible says, David's God is the God who puts our sins behind his back so that they cannot cast a shadow on us and on our fellowship with God. Because you see, God is light. We'll sing in just a few minutes, walk in the light. God is light. And when our sins are there between us and God, our sins cast a shadow. But when our sins are confessed and forgiven, God takes these sins, puts them behind his back, so that his light Oh, and his light speaks of his love and all the rest about him shines on us and on our fellowship with God and, in, and on our service for God without any shadows. I think we see something of this and I'm almost reluctant to speak about it this morning any further. We see something of this in the last part of the chapter from verse 4 to the end. There are still battles, there's still conflict, there's still confrontation with the powers of evil. And here in this chapter, evil appears again as it had once appeared earlier in the form of giants. Now giants, well I don't know about you, maybe I'm a simple soul. Giants can frighten and demoralize. And I'm quite sure that the readers of Chronicles, for whom the book was written, I'm sure they would remember how Israel had failed on the borders of the promised land at the time of the story of Joshua and Caleb. And they said, oh, oh, we can't go forward. They said the spies came back with a report. Oh, they said, we, we, we can't go forward. There's, 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 there's too many problems. And oh, the, the inhabitants of that land are like giants. But Joshua and Caleb said, we, we are able because the Lord our God will fight for us. Read it in Numbers chapter 13 and Deuteronomy chapter 1. We'll put away the markers. We won't look them up this morning. The people who read the story of Chronicles would remember the story of David and Goliath. Do you remember it? It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And the one verse I'm quoting is where little David, and he was a wee chap, and there was Goliath. I don't know if Goliath had six fingers in each hand and six toes in each foot, but he was a mighty character. The description of him is, oh, is almost, is almost beyond our grasp. So there was mighty Goliath symbolizing the powers of evil and there was little David. Do you remember what David said? He said to this incarnate evil called Goliath, You come to me with sword and spear, but I come in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. And Goliath was finished. Now, says the chronicler to the people back in their land, facing the future full of demand, the persons of evil and the powers of evil fell before David. Verse 8 of our chapter and we're finished. 
they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. And you see, my friends, and I've preached to you out of my heart this morning, it is when we are right with God. It is when we are in the right place where God wants us to be. Not only then are we safe, but it is then that we hear clearly the glorious truths of Scripture. Jesus said, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. There's nothing to be afraid of. And John in his epistle says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, my friends, because we have a God who forgives a God who restores, a God who saves, a God who keeps, and a God who uses us. See to it that we are where God wants us to be. Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold upon eternal life. And to do that, to do that, walk in the light with God and be sure, whatever else you are sure about, be sure that you are in the right place. Amen, and may God bless to us his word.